So today, we're going to deal with externalities. If you look at any past papers, you notice that this is one of the most commonly tested topics. So let's start right from the beginning. Externalities falls under the remit of something called market failure. But before we define market failure, I want to take us back to the very first lesson that we had together. The very first session that you would have ever had in economics, you would have been asked to define the basic economic problem. So what's the basic economic problem? Well, the basic economic problem is that we individuals have infinite wants. If I could have everything, I'd have everything. But there are scarce resources. Therefore, we need to allocate these scarce resources in the most efficient way. So bear that in mind. Market failure, the definition that I'd like you to write down is simply this. Market failure is where the free market fails to allocate resources efficiently. It's as simple as that. Now, within that is a concept known as externalities. But before we define an externality, I want to take you through an example. And I want this example to be in the back of your mind every single time you hear the word externalities. Imagine a chemical company. The chemical company decides to dump its waste into a nearby river. They do that because it's just a lot cheaper to dump it into the river than to take it to the appropriate sites. The water company now comes to extract water specifically from that river, but they have to filter out all of the excess waste. Logically, what would you expect to happen to the price that you and I pay for our water? Well, the price that we pay for water obviously is going to go up. How comes? It's because the cost for the water company has just gone up. Now, we know from a very simplistic supply and demand perspective that when costs go up, supply shifts inwards and the price goes up. So what's the big deal? The big deal is that none of it would have happened though if it wasn't for the chemical company in the first place. That in essence is an externality. Because an externality is where someone does something and it has a spillover effect to others that were not involved in the decision making. So you and I, we didn't go up to the chemical company and go, excuse me, I'd like to pay a bit more for my water. Can you dump some waste in there? Of course not. But we were impacted by their decision to do so. Second example, probably happens to you on a daily basis. You're walking down the street and you walk past someone that's smoking. What happens to you? Well, you passively smoke. Is that good or bad for you? It's pretty bad for you. That again is an example of an externality because that individual's decision to smoke the cigarette didn't just impact them, it now impacted you and all the other people around them. The definition of an externality is simply this. An externality is the third party spillover effect arising from a private transaction. Now, that's quite wordy. Not a big fan of wordy definitions. So what I want to do together is I want us to contextualize. I want us to take the key concepts of that definition and mold them around our two examples. So the first key term is the third party. Who is the third party in our example of the chemical company? Now, if you said chemical company, you're probably in the majority of people who tend to get this wrong. The third party is whomever is not involved but impacted by whatever's happening. So in our example, us. The individuals that now pay more for water, that is the third party. What's the spillover effect to us? Well, the spillover effect is simply the fact that we pay more for water. Arising from a private transaction. The private transaction in any externality is always whoever instigates it. Whoever started the whole process off, that is the private company. So in this instance, the chemical company. And what was the transaction? Well, the chemical company decided to dump their waste that is the transaction that started this whole thing off. In terms of our second example, who's the third party? Well, you, the individual that walks by and now passively smokes. And you could argue, by the way, beyond that, the NHS, because the NHS aren't just treating the smoker, they're now treating you, the passive smoker, as well. And the private transaction? Well, that individual buying the cigarette and consuming the cigarette, that is the private transaction. So that's our starting point. Now, we're going to do this in a really backwards way. We're going to go through how to construct the diagram systematically one step at a time first, and then we're going to add the theory second. I'm crazy, I know. So, in order for us to construct the diagram though, there are two concepts in your spec that we haven't yet come across that I just briefly want to explain. The first is something called marginal cost. Marginal is just a really fancy way that we economists like to say one more unit. So marginal cost is the cost of producing, one more unit. The second term, marginal benefit, is how much benefit do you get by consuming one more unit? Now, 
Whenever you draw these diagrams, or whenever you look at examiner reports in relation to these diagrams, you'll notice that very often students mess up marginal costs and marginal benefits. They have one is upward sloping when it should be downward, and vice versa. You are never, ever, ever allowed to make that mistake. And the reason you're never going to make that mistake is because we're going to come up with a really silly way of remembering it that has nothing to do with economics. Now, I can't hear your answer, so you're going to have to say it out loud, but what is your favorite chocolate bar? Mine, Kinder Bueno. So, let's go through the example of me getting a Kinder Bueno. When I get my first Kinder Bueno, I really enjoy that first Kinder Bueno. It's great. I got a lot of benefit from that first bar. Imagine the second I finished that Kinder Bueno, I got a second Kinder Bueno. I like it, but not quite as much as that first one. And then a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, my threshold is pretty high. After about like nine, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to be sick. This is kind of disgusting. On that basis, was my marginal benefit increasing or decreasing as I got more and more Kinder Buenos? Well, obviously it was decreasing. I was getting less and less benefit from each additional Kinder Bueno that I was eating. Therefore, do you expect marginal benefits to be upward sloping or downward sloping? You got it. The downward sloping. Because as quantity rises, my benefit from each additional unit goes down. So whatever your chocolate bar is, just remember that and remember that marginal benefits will be downward sloping because of that idea. It's a bit like going to a buffet. The first meal you get up, you love it, it's great. The second time you go up, you, you like it, but not as much. When you're getting up the third and fourth time, you're just doing it to try and save money. We know that, okay? But marginal benefits are therefore downward sloping. If marginal benefits are downward sloping, it follows that marginal costs must obviously just be the opposite. They are upward sloping. Okay, so that's our first phase. The next phase is to draw the actual diagram. So that was the build up for you to have an understanding of what marginal costs and marginal benefits actually are. Write the following heading on your piece of paper and just walk with me. The heading is negative production externality. Now bear in mind, by the way, those of you that are on the Edexcel specification, they have done it now so that there is only two diagrams that you're expected to know, positive and negative. So production, consumption doesn't really make that much of a difference for you. So we're gonna go through a systematic step-by-step -step in order for us to get every single mark on this diagram. Step one, and I know it says it on the heading, but humor me. Is this a negative or positive externality? Well, it's negative. Therefore, do you expect that to be to do with costs or with benefits? Costs, right? Therefore, step one, the moment that you know that you're dealing with a negative externality, draw me two slightly pivoted upward sloping lines, but don't label them just yet. Step two, given that we have upward sloping lines, it follows that there must only be one downward sloping line. Draw that. Now, because there's only one downward sloping line, I can label that straight away. Now, in every single externality that you ever deal with, there are always two players. Player one is the private party. So in the example of the chemical company, they're the private party. Player two is social, society, everyone else. So just remember that you've got private and you've got social. So I can label that downward sloping curve. And what we would label it as is marginal, M, private, P, benefit. Because remember, benefit lines are downward sloping. And that would be equal to marginal social benefit. The reason is, is because our analysis is focused on the costs. That is the big difference in this particular diagram. So we assume that your benefits are just consistently the same. So the first thing that you can label is MPB equals MSB. Step three. The next step is, can you see that there are two points of intersection on our diagram? Dot down and across from those two points of intersection. Don't label anything just yet. Step, think four. Step four. Negative externalities are always where you are doing too much of something that is bad. A positive externality is where you're always doing too little of something that's good, which is why it's also bad. But in terms of our diagram right now, we're doing a negative externality. So, are we doing too little or too much? Well, we just said that we're doing too much. Can you see that on the quantity, there are two potential quantities? Which one makes sense to be the equilibrium? If I said that we're doing too much, well, obviously, the second one must be the equilibrium. Label that QE. And the adjoining price that goes with it, label that P. Now the other one, call it Q star and P star. We'll explain what that is later on in the video. Now, now that I know where equilibrium is, put your pen exactly at that point. Can you see that there is only one upward sloping curve going through that particular point? Something that you just need to always know and remember is that market equilibrium 
always occurs, irrespective of which externality you're dealing with, where marginal private benefits equal marginal private costs. In the example of the smoker, they only consume what they think is beneficial to them, their costs against their benefits. They don't really care about what's happening to the rest of society. The chemical company, when they dump their waste, the only thing they care about is their costs against their benefits. Therefore, if that is equilibrium, when you put your pen at that point, you know that that upward sloping line going through it must be marginal, private, given that it's upward sloping, cost. So it's MPC. Now we only have one line left. What must that line be? Well, marginal, who's player two? Social, and again, it's an upward sloping line, so it's costs. Bear in mind, the point at which P star and Q star, where they hit one another, it has a fancy name, which is known as social optimum. Social optimum basically represents where we would like to be. If we were there, there wouldn't be a market failure. There wouldn't be a misallocation of resources. But we're not at social optimum. The point that we're operating at is QEPE, where MPC equals MPB. The last thing that you need to do on your diagram to pick up all the marks is draw the welfare loss triangle. Now, this is the most common error that students make, because can you see that there's two potential triangles on that diagram? The way that you ensure that you never, ever get it wrong is simply put your pen on the actual equilibrium and draw a straight line up. That triangle represents the welfare loss. This represents, in essence, what society is losing out on. Because the difference, by the way, between your marginal private cost and your marginal social cost, that is the external cost. That is the spillover effect that we haven't factored in that we should factor in. Now, one more thing as a little heads up for you to check that your triangle is correct is, can you see that our triangle looks like it's pointing to the left? Well, in other words, it's kind of saying to us, hey, you're doing too much of this thing, do less. When it's a positive externality, you'll notice that the triangle will be pointing to the right, which is to say, you need to do more of this, you're not doing enough of it. And that is the diagram. Now, in terms of contextualization, a negative externality is anything where in the production process, you end up having a negative impact on others. Examples of this in previous papers. January 2013 had a question about the overfishing of mackerel, how they were overfishing mackerel to the point where they were about to go extinct. Negative externality. Another example was a few years ago, they had a paper about a massive house building project in the north of England. And it was very clear from the data that this was a negative externality because they said, look, there's gonna be high levels of congestion. There's gonna be lots of jobs in that local area lost because businesses suffer etc, etc, etc. Anything that in the production or consumption process results in negative consequences that are not factored in is a negative externality. So now that we've done negative externality, let's deal with positive externality. Step one, again, humor me. What type of externality is this? Well, it's positive. So is that to do with benefits or costs? Benefits. So the first thing that I'd like you to draw now is two downward sloping, slightly pivoted benefit lines. Step two. Given that there are two downward sloping lines, it follows that there must only be one upward sloping line. So draw that. The next thing that we can do is because there's only one upward sloping curve, I can label that straight away, no problem. So let's do it together. It's always marginal, so M. And then remember, who's player one? Player one is private, so M, P. And let's see if you figure this out. Is it cost or benefits? Upward sloping curves are always costs, so it's M, P, C equals, because there's only one line, MSC, marginal social cost. Now, again, can you see that there are two points of intersection on our diagram? Dot down and across from the two points of intersection. And now ask yourself the following question. Is it positive or negative? Well, it's positive. Does that mean we're doing too little or too much of this thing? Positive is always where you're doing too little of a good thing. You're doing too little, hence there's still a market failure. So which one must be the equilibrium, the first quantity or the second quantity? Obviously the first. We call that QE, we call the price that goes with it PE. The other quantity therefore must be Q star, P star. Now again, put your pen exactly at the point where we are at equilibrium. Notice that there is only one downward sloping curve going through that particular point. You know what that is straight away. It has to be a private line. The only way for that to be equilibrium is where MPB equals MPC. So now that I know my quantity is definitely that, I go, okay, that downward sloping curve must be MP, and is it cost or benefits? It's downward sloping, therefore it is benefits. 
MPB, and the final thing must therefore be MSB. One more thing left and the diagram is complete. The last thing that we need to do is shade in what's called the welfare gain triangle this time. It's what society could gain, the external benefits that we haven't taken into account. Again, put your pen on the equilibrium point, draw a straight line up, and your triangle is really, really obvious now. Shade it in, label it, and that diagram is done. Just before we wrap this up, just wanna go through an example of a positive externality in terms of real life. There are two examples that they tend to give in the exam. The first is higher education. I'd actually encourage you guys to do the theme one June 2012 paper because it has a great data response on that. But higher education, if you think about it, if you go to university, well, great for you. The private benefits that you achieve are hopefully you're gonna get a higher paid job. You are more likely to be able to afford nice expensive things. So great for you. But society benefits even more from you being educated than you yourself. Because one, you pay taxes. Number two, you won't be on welfare benefits. Number three, you could be the next Steve Jobs, who knows? You come up with innovative, amazing products that help people and change their lives. Society benefits more from you being educated than you yourself. Therefore, we assume that there is a positive externality because not enough people are going into higher education. The second example is even more straightforward, vaccinations. If you get vaccinated, great, because the private benefits for you is that you can't contract a particular disease. But society benefits even more when you get vaccinated because of the fact that you cannot spread the disease. So again, we're making the assumption that if there's a positive externality in vaccinations, it means not enough people are getting vaccinated. It's as simple as that. Hope that made sense. Check out some of our other videos and we'll see you again soon.